Thanks. Um, Make sure you're talking to the microphone. Please. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much, um, Pierre. Um, I basically want to talk uh, this afternoon about a couple of projects I'm involved in. Uh, Piers mentioned the GovHack, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of. Um, and the other one's um, uh, Community Cloud, which is a, a new not-for-profit that I'm involved in setting up. And both of these things are basically around um, issues to do with technology, but effectively intersecting the issues of uh, of community, of government, of commercial IT uh, and research. And so they both have that kind of flavour about it and, and I guess essentially where my interest lies. Um, uh, in terms of starting off with um, uh, probably the, the GovHack, um, you, you'd be aware that the um, part of the issue around open data is not just the publishing of it, but it's that whole issue around how we can actually uh, then use that to further other outcomes. Um, one of the things I'm passionate about, Pierre mentioned um, uh, government as API. Um, and that issue, I've worked a lot in the non-profit sector in terms of delivering services to clients. Um, I worked for Relationships Australia for about eight and a half years. Um, and part of that was looking at the, how the actual average citizen ends up using uh, technology, how they access services and type of that. So we're looking at it from a technical perspective, but when you start looking at down the individual citizen and how it impacts on their lives, I'd just like to reinforce what Pierre was saying earlier, is that it, you know, government has the capacity to hugely influence uh, the services that we consume and how our, our general lives are affected. And so therefore, actually creating up um, uh, the, the data in a way that allows it to be accessible both in terms of for accountability purposes but also in terms of actual service delivery I think is actually critical in terms of where we're going as a society. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, GovHack provides an opportunity for um, which is fairly uh, uh, um, developer or tech focused at one level um, but what it does um, from a number of perspectives it allows um, and I'll go through, the, I guess, the various components. So if you're in the public service or in government and you're actually, what you've got your uh, knowledge where you've got information about your area that you're interested in, it's a good way to go and actually then engage with people that can actually, you know, test some of that um, out in terms of the technology and so forth and see what's possible. It's also a really good um, option in terms of as the data holder, you might be um, pushing data around and say, look, we've got it really fabulous here, it's, it's exciting, it's really usable, um, but um, uh, until you test it with a group of developers and saying, well, this is this fabulous thing that we've created, you don't necessarily know whether it actually, one, is really accessible, uh, and two, whether it's actually going to be useful in, in, in the way it's um, formatted. Um, the other thing is I think it's also a good, great way to actually just get involved in the whole discussion. So um, uh, Helen mentioned before that we had um, a you know, historian come along and be involved in that uh, process and came up with a great app. So it's mixing people from very different perspectives. Often if, you've, if you're um, you know, um, getting an app written and it's just developers, there, there's, you can get kind of locked in. But if you can actually participate the community into it, get government involved and you've got multiple stakeholders all working on the little projects and that's one of the beauties I think of GovHack because it really demonstrates that kind of interesting kind of mixture of people not just from a technical background and not just from a knowledge background and mixing that up and that I think involves in better data and better apps. Um, and that probably, I mean, we won't do a spin for GovHack but it is, <laughs> it is 11th to 14th of July um, there, uh, go to the website, there's stuff there. If you want to be involved either as a data provider or, or in terms of a sponsor or a participant, that's all open to you. I'm sure it'll be repeated at other times as well. Um, in terms of Community Cloud, it's a, it's a project that has come out of basically seeing uh, what happens in uh, not-for-profits in terms of ICT. Um, and particularly looking at issues around when you're trying to share data um, across non-profit and government sectors. And what we're looking at doing is creating, I guess, a platform to share data. Um, and some of it's quite specific. Um, so um, 
but allow um, uh, there to be uh, collaboration to occur on data and for, um, uh, I guess, a reference architecture effectively to be developed uh, that can then be reused um, and essentially um, uh, uh, that function, all those services, uh, to be integrated. So if I give you a, a kind of a, um, a top level example, um, uh, as an NGO, you're often required to um, publish what, what services happen or refer someone. So it's fine if I've got my kind of database of service providers, but how do I know where to refer to? And certainly once I start referring someone from my service to another service, how do I do that? Um, some government departments do it so that you refer up to them and refer back down again and you get into a whole lot of privacy issues. If I've got two different systems, how do I refer across? Um, and so it's taking this from an issue of, of being the, the end user, doesn't matter what technology you want, they one want to know about the service, they don't know what department it's done by. They want to basically be able to say, look, here's the service, I want to access it, when is it available? What do I need? I'm a subsidised, am I not? Um, and then I want to be referred on to another service provider. So at the moment there's not a lot of kind of um, capacity for that to happen. And it's done in a community in terms of the non-profit community. Generally you'll find um, in WA we're lucky we've got Lottery West, you can get CapEx funding, but operational funding is not possible um, a lot of the time. You've got very low level of IT skill within organisations usually. Um, you may have access to volunteers, but then that's another whole management overhead. So some of the things that Community Cloud are working on and trying to look at those, those issues about in between effectively the tech sector and, and the um, uh, non-profit and government sectors and seeing if we can come up with a framework and some tools and so forth to actually increase the collaboration and, and provide more access to specifically to services for the end consumer. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hello. Um, does this work? Yeah. Yep. Cool. A quick show of hands. How many government folks are here? All right. That's pretty good. Programmers? Okay. And the rest of you? Normal people. Normal people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and a child. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. As Pierre said, I'm a developer day to day. Um, I work at Langate. Um, I work on the uh, Slip project. Um, that's essentially WA's spatial data warehouse as such. Um, came back in about 2007, so WA was leading in open data at one point. Perhaps less so now. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about um, GovPond, which Helen alluded to earlier, and then throw some random thoughts at you about what government can do better in the open source space. Um, came out of GovHack last year, um, we needed need to find what data was in WA for the devs to work on, and we just started Googling, essentially. Found bits and pieces here and there, found 100, found 200. Eventually found 3,500 data sets on .wa.gov.au domains and realized we had a problem. <laughs> um, so we built a rough search interface around that, um, very much just Google box, type a, type a search term in, it'll go off and do all the searching for you. It was a hand-curated list, so think about that for a moment. Three and a half thousand hand-curated bits and pieces. There were lots of long nights and plenty of bottles of wine in that one. Um, after that, we built in some federated searching to GovPond, so it'll go off and search its own database and it'll go to peers data.gov.au, all the state data platforms, we'll go to CSIRO's platform, uh, Australian Ocean Data Network, a few other ones. So it's GovPond's catalogue of a few thousand plus umpteen thousand more off elsewhere. Um, I know Piers assuming some things like that for the data.gov.au site. Um, but yeah, that was our sort of foray into the area. Um, we kind of see GovPond as sitting sitting between where we are now and we want to be with open data and, and data discovery and data searching. Um, the official portals are great and they're wonderful, but they've only got the 
top surface level of the data that's there. You've got three or four hundred data sets, Rest. something like that. Certainly not on DataGovAU yet, but yeah. Yeah, and yeah, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, obviously, hand curating up 10,000 data sets isn't a good long-term solution, mm -hmm. but it's the best we can do in the short term, so it may as well be done. Mm -hmm. um, We've also linked on GovPond to various departmental search, search portals and databases they have. So you've got your individual list of data sets and whatnot. You've also got random departmental search site as well and various other databases there. Um, we're going to continue to add data sets and portals to that. We'd really like to get the ABS in there somehow, but they're not very easy to work with. Mm. <laughs> Great people, but their search thing is not very nice to plug into, so we'll see where that goes. Um, we're doing a bit of work with the CRC for spatial information. They're keen to do a gut pond for spatial nationally, essentially, um, and we're going to work with them in some capacity to take our code and produce gut pond spatial um, in some official capacity. Um, that's all for gut pond, really. It's govpond.org. I'll just Google it. Um, pond. Pond, yes. It's a, it's a big puddle. puddle of water. Yep. <laughs> puddle of data. Yep. Gov pond. Um, as far as government and open source goes, I've been sitting here writing down various random points people have brought up, and mostly it's already been brought up. But I'll just reiterate a bunch of stuff because I think it's useful. Um, government needs to talk to government more. Um, mm -hmm. If you're solving a problem or have a question, odds are someone's already done it. And odds are you're just reinventing the wheel if you're going to spend an age coding it up or researching or writing a paper about it. Um, we need a lot better communication, particularly in the technical fields and scientific fields. Um, we benefit as much from open data as the public does, if not more, because what we do day to day mm -hmm. is look at data governments produced use it for various purposes and so on. So trying to convince government that open data is not just producing something for businesses or for you know, a shiny new iPhone app, but to make government do government better, essentially. Um, educating each other more and explain to our colleagues why like CSV files are important. Why your report, great, it's a PDF, that's fine. Produce a CSV file with it as well change our processes so that the CSV file or the whatever you want to produce is as much part of the publishing process as making the PDF is and putting it on the website mm -hmm. and doing the press release. Which is a really, it's a really boring thing, but level three officers should be, have some knowledge of this and why it's important. And you know, there's umpteen thousand, certain thousand of them in government and just need to go to them individually and say, this is why you should do this, this is why it's important. They're not all technical, so some sort of knowledge base of explaining the technical stuff to them in layman's terms. I think we probably need, uh, the UK has the Open Data Institute. They do weekly, bi-weekly talks on various open government subjects. Um, incredibly well resourced, incredibly well researched. A great knowledge base for this sort of thing that we don't really have here. Um, Given we're not London, Perth is just a bit smaller. We probably can't do that, but if we can just do something nationally, some sort of virtual knowledge base, I think would be very much useful. Um, Make a video. Several videos. Yeah. Um, we need to engage more with stakeholders, which if you're in government, it's probably on your JDF already. I think it's pretty much standard. Um, but talk to developers, talk to NGOs, community sector, they're also our stakeholders. If we're using open source software, we should be seeing the people writing it as our stakeholders as well. They're not just people that give us free software that's great. They're our stakeholders, we're their stakeholders essentially. Um, don't be afraid to uh, fork it and put patches back into it. Having that visibility of the source code is, it's fantastic. If it's not it's not a vendor locking anymore. If there's a bug, you can go and see it. You can fix it. Or someone else has probably already fixed it. Um, that's incredibly useful. 
we should use you know wikis and GitHub and so forth more. Um, arguably, if you can version it and if you can file issues against it, sure, put it on GitHub. If it's public and there's no IP associated with it, put it on there. You know, if the parliamentary draft has put legislation on GitHub, what would happen? Who knows? But it'd be fantastic. Mm. <laughs> um, I kind of like the idea of um, the chap that runs Amazon, Bezos, I think it is. Um, he had this notion early on at Amazon of Amazon as an API. Each part of Amazon would only talk to the others via API calls. Um, probably a bit of a leap to do that in government at this stage, but if we could start down that path where government had to eat its own dog food, we get a lot better APIs and they'd be stable. Yep. Um, that's probably all we had, I think. Yeah. Can I just add something to what you said? Yeah. Um, you were talking about bugs. And yeah. The fact that someone can fix that and submit that bug. Yeah. I, I don't find government agencies particularly interested in fixing bugs. Yeah. But what I find as a concrete benefit to them is when they want to develop new features and you develop a feature for a particular version of your software and it's merged back to the original project. And then with the next release of Drupal, WordPress, or whatever you're using, your feature is still there. Yep. While when working with proprietary software, often the investment you make on that software never gets to the vendor of the original software. And with the next release, you need to reinvest all over again to get the feature that you use. Mm -hmm. So not so much on the bug side, but on the new feature side. That's a very concrete benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so from now on every, I'm not going to try to wrap that up, and from now on every comment needs to go into the microphone, please, <laughs> sure, sure. for the recording, only because they're, they're going to publish all this later, just sure, for the details, thank you. Okay, do you want to take comment? the microphone, yes please, rather than me trying right, to, because right. that, that okay. was a really good comment. So I'll just repeat what I just said, um, I was saying that I don't see many government agencies uh, interested in, in fixing bugs and committing that back to the original projects, but when investing uh, in new features, the fact that the feature uh, will be there and sometimes will go back, merged upstream and back to the original project and will be there on the next release of that software, that's a concrete benefit because what often happens with proprietary software is that you do your custom development, you add your feature, but with the next release you need to invest all over again to get that benefit. Uh, and this is something that doesn't happen with open source. So long you can work with the uh, communities in getting uh, that there. And this is also somewhere where the policy implementation, um, sorry, the, the following of the policy can actually help. So sometimes to actually um, get, a lot of people see government as a single-headed beast that can be led um, and that can be um, directed. And it's just not the case. Like uh, there's a lot of autonomy across every department and there's a lot of autonomy across the different jurisdictions in government. There is, uh, the, the current policy says if an agency is doing open source, then they should be contributing that open source back to the project. It, it says that in the open source policy. Um, so, but a lot of agencies don't know about the open source policy. So, some, so part of this is about, if you don't mind me using the phrase, arming the peasant. Um, so you know, us, whoop, us that are out there doing stuff, um, going out and figuring out what policies are in place that actually support the work we're trying to do, and then saying to our managers, well, um, in my case, it's fine because my manager is totally awesome. But saying to our managers, uh, here's what the policy says and therefore we should be following government policy, should we not? And if we're not going to follow government policy, then you need to mitigate that risk. <laughs> um, so putting that, um, and, and so we're using the existing policy, uh, it's the same with the um, Creative Commons by default policy that was set in 2010. When I say to agencies, what license do you want to use, you get caught up in an absolute hell of legalese between all the different de departments getting their legal teams involved. When you say, here's the default, you will, of course, you know, why would you want to detract from what the Attorney General has defined as the default? They go, oh yeah, we don't want to take on that risk of going away from the default. Yeah. So um, go out and figure out what policies actually support what you're doing and actually use them as your risk mitigation. Because it's not that people are bad or trying to do the wrong thing, it's just that they're trying to cover, their, cover themselves. Yeah. So, and the policy landscape at the moment really supports this stuff, so we need to make sure that we're, we're reinforcing that. Um, any, other, any other comments immediately? All right, I might throw a question first and then um, we'll, we'll pass to you. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I, I do love you. It's fine. All right, go on. Sorry. <laughs> I'll just stick that there. Sorry. Um, I won't chat for very long, but is that working? Good. Okay, you can hear me. Um, so I want to talk uh, about this discussion a little bit from the community perspective. Um, I've had a background in community uh, activism. 
and uh, in addition to wearing my academic hat and my and my hat as a professional journalist, um, uh, I've been involved in all sorts of local campaigns to help save libraries from being closed and save the Fitzroy Pool from yeah. being closed and and a set of other activities. And I'll talk about one of those campaigns because I think it gives um, briefly some lessons. Um, but uh, the rarity of the future um, is actually about eyeball time. And if you want to get community engagement, you know, I sense there's a really positive vibe about uh, from a set of technical people at this conference who want to do things to um, make, you know, gov hack work, make the idea of bringing government information and not just information but analysis support, all of these things in a technical perspective um, to the community. Uh, the question is how you um, find that community and you match up with it. Um, so uh, eyeball time and getting that uh, rare time from the community activists is increasingly the scarcity factor in all of this. They are the diamonds that are harder and harder to find. Um, and so I think in a sense uh, government needs to talk more to government but government also needs to talk more to the community and in fact one of the areas I'm interested in researching in the longer term is um, whether you can use technology as a way of um, in a sense shortening the lead between um, the citizenry and politicians and the citizenry and policy makers so that the the thread that binds them as you tug it or push it or pull it is more responsive and in a faster um, time frame. Uh, and technology provides the, the way to do that. But um, one thing that I think is a little bit different is that the way that you get citizens engaged typically in a project uh, is something like the Save the Fitzroy Pool campaign, but the way that governments um, and people in government often uh, are involved in these projects is much more longer term, very planned out, um, very organized, perhaps a little less agile. And so there, there's potentially a mismatch. Um, so if I can just give you a, a sort of two minute briefing. Um, in 1994, uh, the unelected commissioners appointed by Premier Jeff Kennett in Victoria decided to close the Fitzroy Pool um, because it was not making a profit. Uh, it was, in fact, losing about $70,000 a year. Um, it was 100000 but it was, you know, 100000 70000 which is relatively small potatoes in, in a city budget. Um, but it did have 70 or 80,000 people a year who, 70 or 80,000 visits. Um, it did need some capital works improvement. They made the mistake of announcing that the pool would be closed uh, for good in, I guess it was about September. Um, and we had a particularly warm spring that year. Mm. So the pool, which was a seasonal pool at that time, was empty. Um, and I was part of the community um, that decided to save this pool, which is actually one of the oldest pools in Victoria and the unique um, uh, concrete uh, design of the pool was actually designed by Sir John Monash in an innovative bit of engineering. So there's a bit of history to it. Um, uh, there's a wall in the pool that says Aqua Profunda, which is actually um, heritage listed because it appears in the film version of Helen Garner's uh, uh, book, um, Monkey Grip. Um, a bit of a Australian culture. So um, we actually uh, broke into about 15, about a core group of 10 to 15 people. Uh, and we had a media group who were going to do the media and we had an analysis group who was gonna do the fact-based analysis on whether it really made sense and the arguments that were being used to save this pool made sense. Uh, and then we had a group that was gonna um, have, you know, organized protests through the streets and a set of other things. Um, I was in the analysis group. And uh, at the end of about an eight week campaign, including school children tying yellow ribbons to the fence, um, including um, getting 1,500 people on a 30 degree Sunday to fill the empty pool with humans uh, and get all of the television news crews to bring their helicopters down and shoot footage from above of the empty pool filled with people, um, including occupying the pool site and getting the Sparkies uh, to not turn off the electricity. Um, to the site, uh, by the end of um, that sort of eight or so week period, um, the state government uh, suggested to the local government commissioners perhaps they should reconsider their decision. Um, 
I have to say of all the community campaigns I've ever been involved with, this campaign to save this little outdoor 50 meter swimming pool that wasn't even heated, well it was partially solar heated very badly, um, uh, was the most impressive community campaign I have ever experienced in my life on any continent. Um, and it brought together people from all walks of life. Um, I think one of the things that united it was there was a single purpose, um, common cause with a deadline um, and that people were absolutely empowered from the get-go to be able to say, I can put my hand up for that. I can put my hand up for that. And there was the usual problem of how you disperse power versus you know, coordinate and all the rest of it, but uh, it worked pretty well with a set of, of weekly meetings. So I would say that if you want to find ways to engage with the community, you need to find the communities that spring up in response to things like that. It may not be about a local swimming pool, although just a couple of years ago, there was a, a pool up by Castle, Maine that was a little po local community pool that was also being closed down, and there was a bit of that same vibe in a kind of a country town, I noticed that. Um, uh, there are other things that pop up like that, and it's important when you're considering these projects that in a sense you do something that perhaps is um, not intuitive to a lot of people in government who are involved in projects, and that is to um, be agile enough, to be flexible enough to drop stuff in order to do stuff. Um, because if you can tap into those little volcanic eruptions when they happen, you will absolutely get bang for your buck in terms of what you are programming, in terms of um, political backing from the community to say to your minister, your leaders, whoever, this information should be public and this is how we want to see it and this is how we want to use it. Um, and you'll get people from the community actually using it. And then they'll be singing the praises to everyone else and you'll get calls from Western Australia and the Northern Territory and South Australia and everyone else going, me too, how do we do it? Um, finding them when they come up isn't always easy. It's obviously reading local media and other things, but I would just say if you can be flexible enough to do that, um, that's a really good opportunity um, to, to grab a hold of. And then the final thing is that that's, that's a model of pursuing one thing that is a kind of a goal and that you tap into the energy of that group and it might run for just a couple of months. There's a bit of that happening right now in Melbourne that's against the, um, it's the uh, uh, trains not tolls campaign for the, the tunnel down the eastern freeway. Um, but uh, the other thing is, is that if you want to engage with the community in a, in a more regular way, less of a, a NASA launch approach uh, and more of an ongoing approach, um, I would say pick out people from as diverse groups as you can and bring them together um, in one room and ask them for feedback along the way. It's really important. I, um, when I was doing my uh, PhD, I had the opportunity to interview the um, state minister, the former state minister in Victoria for energy. Um, and I asked him about, I was asking about power plant planning and a set of other things anyway. Um, one of the things he said was he had come in, there had been a very staid and very un, you know, interesting government prior to his, and he came in and was willing to really shake things up. He was a change agent. Um, but what he used to do is he used to take people from little NGO community groups, which he would fund for thirty or forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, um, as well as community activists and bureaucrats, uh, and he would put them in the room with the electricity um, providers and a set of other people, and he'd say, "Don't come out until you guys have agreed." on a set of things that will be done to provide energy efficiency improvements in homes, to provide reasonable electricity pricing to people who live in caravan parks, a whole set of things. Uh, and um, while there may have been some dead bodies on the floor, uh, by the time the door was opened, there were really um, impactful and good outcomes from that. And I think in some ways that provides the model for a longer term sustainable consultation with the community sector. So I hope that's helpful. Cool. I'm going to make a very quick comment and then we're going to go straight to you guys for questions. Um, only because I've, I've been involved in a number of um, uh, public policy uh, community consultations now. Uh, in fact, um, uh, we sort of led the way with developing a methodology which sort of took the best of the traditional approach and combined it with, um, I guess, online um, ways of doing things as well. Uh, we called it the, the public sphere um, online, uh, well, community engagement methodology. And basically, regard and it's not even just online, it, regardless of your community and where they talk and where they congregate and where they discuss, 
The idea is to go where they are rather than building something and, and then hoping people will come and talk to you, basically saying where are the conversations already happening, how do we tap into them and how do we engage with the communities that can contribute expertise and perspective into the consultation. Um, the biggest one I did was a seven week <laughs> consultation for, a national, for the national cultural policy uh, when that was being um, consulted on. Uh, to get digital culture represented in that policy. And I think we ended up having about 1,500 people contribute to that consultation, uh, resulting in 108 specific policy ideas, each one of which we were able to say with a, a good amount of confidence, um, here's the sectors that have contributed to this space, here's the, uh, the general themes and sentiment around and, and commentary around each one of those policy ideas, here's, um, how, here's the prioritisation of each of those policy areas about you know, how much people voted them up or voted them down or controversy around them or whatever. And it was, it's important to note that when it comes to community consultation with government, the first thing that people freak out about um, in government is, well, what if it gets gamed? By a, a lobbyist group, by a you know, by by people in a different space, by a particular you know, individual who maybe is nefarious. You know, what happens if they say something nasty or this kind of um, fears? And the the simple answer to that is, you need online community or you need community engagement people, community management people, which is a skill set that a lot of people aren't taught in government. Um, and it is a little bit different than the traditional approach where you say, here's what we've already done. What do you think? You're saying, how do we co-develop this stuff? Um, and the other aspect of that is uh, contextual analysis, which I, I touched upon briefly this morning. The idea that you need to be able to analyse the community who, of participation while at the same time allowing some anonymity. So I've always believed that allowing anonymous contributions is very important because there will be people for legitimate reasons who can't say where they work that will have useful things to put in. And if you say, you know, uh, 27 people thought that this was a bad idea who have chosen to remain anonymous. Um, it, it doesn't say that it's, it, you know, not legit, it's just giving it some context. Um, if you can say with some confidence, we know that 90% of the people that participated in this consultation are actually in Australia, um, physically, um, uh, you know, that, that these different sectors are represented, that um, these different demographics are represented. At the worst, the worst case scenario when you introduce that kind of contextual analysis is that the outcomes of your consultation you may be able to demonstrate are not representative of the broader community. Great. Now you can say, we now need to specifically go out and consult outside of that user group. When you just have an open door town hall meeting, you have, and as Q&A has very aptly demonstrated, you have no idea how well you're being gamed. Um, so, so you actually have a, a, the benefit of getting better, better representative and evidence-based policy outcomes. Now, um, I, I've been informed that we need to finish on time. So we're going to go for some questions. You guys. Yes, up the back. Hold on. Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <coughs> While I'm walking. I do, I do love you, you know. It's <laughs> are those methods documented somewhere, put on the web? Yes, of course. I'm Pia. This is what I do. Yes, I'll, I'll make a link. Um. A, a few people mentioned um, moving to APIs rather than static data dumps. Um, I've done a bit of freelance data journalism and one of the things that's very interesting is to grab an entire data set that the government or WikiLeaks or whatever have published and then grab it again in a week or a day or an mm -hmm. hour and see what's changed. Yeah. And the problem I've got with, uh, well, not the problem, but what I'd be, like to be interested to know is do you think that um, governments are aware that those APIs should not have limits that mean that you can't enumerate the entire data set because um, a large number of government departments do sort of restrict you to a thousand queries and you can hack around it, mm -hmm. but it's painful. Okay, um, so that, that I'm going to give you a very quick answer, but, the, the, but that's not this kind of panel. The, so the, the very quick answer to that basically is that um, First of all, different types of data sets are going to have different API limitations depending on the data. So census data you obviously don't want to download in aggregate because you've got problems with that from a security and privacy perspective or privacy perspective mostly. But um, trying to educate about the issues of API limitations for, data, for other sort of data sets is important, but it also comes down to an education perspective about data. Keeping in mind some of the people that I work with, not in necessarily my department, but you know, some of the people that I deal with every day think that open data is a printed version of their portfolio budget statement. All right, that's open data to them. So there's a lot of education that goes into how to, how to publish data and publish it well. Mm -hmm. And generally that means that the next version of the data set that goes up should be appended, not replacing. So you do have that historical record about what's going on. So yeah, that understood. Questions for community engagement stuff? I think you Sorry? No? Oh, we have one. <laughs> 
<laughs> Hello, little citizen. <laughs> it's okay, Sunet. It's fine. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, how exactly did you and people from the committee uh, <laughs> come together and save the Fitzroy pool? Like, how did you come together? Um. You were worried there for a second, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a good question. I'll just reiterate that. <laughs> the question from the youngest member of the audience, youngest, <laughs> was uh, how did the uh, people from the community come together to save the Fitzroy Pool, which I might add only recently celebrated its one millionth visit to the pool uh, and has been rated in the last couple of years of surveying by the city of Yarra as the most important and well-loved icon in the city of Yarra. Um, uh, we came together by, it was very interesting, a small group of people just telephoned, two or three people we each knew, and showed up in someone's living room um, uh, one evening. And from that, we then organized um, a meeting at the, um, at the old footy grounds up the road. And it was a freezing cold night that night. Uh, and we, had, we invited the bishop to, to come and speak, um, uh, as well as um, John Clark, who was extremely funny. Uh, and from that, the whole thing just absolutely took off. We got a couple of articles in the local newspaper. And when I said before, you know, being agile, it is a little bit about reading not just the big daily metropolitan in your area and even just online, but sometimes your local little weekly community trashy newspaper um, to find out what's important. Um, but that's that thing, that little nub, that kernel of people coming together um, is the thing that is so special. And it does happen from time to time. Uh, and it's the thing you, it's gold. You know, if you can tap into that, you are tapping into people's creativity. And that is the most valuable thing. And they may not have the creative powers that you do of coding, but they have the creative powers of explaining what it is that they need to get the change that they want in the community. And if you can take that with your creative powers and translate that into something that's scalable, it's the jackpot. Cool. Any last question or comment? Uh, there's one just up the back here. Thank you. <clears throat> it, it, perhaps one more for you, but I'm, I'm just wondering if um, data.gov.au or data.wa.gov.au or the, the various data sites are the face of open data. Um, how, what was the level of community engagement in the design of those various portals? Awesome question. <laughs> so the, the, the answer to that, so, um, okay. So first of all, um, when we first came into the job, uh, when I first came into the job, because this was going to be one of the things I do with data.gov.au, first thing I did was figure out all the other people in government doing stuff. And I already knew most of the people in industry and the uh, civil society doing stuff because this is kind of what I do. Um, but, um, and then what we did was we did a, a blog post saying, this is what we're thinking of doing. Uh, this is the technology we're thinking of using. And we ran a developer, um, both a developer, a government, and a just general open couple of discussion sessions um, publicly. And it was all live streamed. And in fact, you can still find the YouTube live stream of them all. Yeah. Purely publicly, and anyone could tune into the YouTube stream, and anyone could ask questions, and anyone could say, "Here's what we reckon you should do." And then what we've done is we've run a continual blog on the progress of it, and asked people for their feedback. Um, we do now monthly reporting on the progress of DataGovAU, um, and we have a live roadmap on basically the plan, so that anyone at any point in time can see where we're at, what we're looking at doing. It's all a little bit. Um, a little bit retro because it's all done pretty much for the blog at the moment, but I'm looking at some um, new stuff to make it a bit shinier and a bit more interactive. But um, we've also launched a data request site so that anyone can go and request data, vote it up, add comments and all the rest of it. And it's been cool because that's only been running just over a month and we've had um, uh, over 40 data requests from 90 people um, with 200 votes or 220 votes or whatever. With GNAF, the, the main federal government spatial data set, the ha most highly requested data set, which is cool. Um, so yeah, we've tried to be very transparent. Now that, that has burnt us a, a number of times now. We came out and said when we relaunched DataGovAU, and then I promise we will stop. Um, um, we, when we relaunched DataGovAU, we said, so a third of the data sets, um, so there were 1,200 data sets, a third of the data sets 
uh, were broken links. A third of the data sets, because um, it hadn't really been um, loved for about uh, two years, um, a third of the data sets were broken links. A third of the data sets were state and territory data sets that they were wanting to launch their own platforms and so they'd moved them back into their own platforms, which is a great thing. You know, it's great to have more people doing this stuff. And it's, so we're only left with a third of which a large number were historic, but still useful and still, use, you know, in, in a lot of cases, useful formats and stuff. Um, so we launched and we said, we've got more new shiny data sets. Um, here are the, here's the reason why we're on 500 data sets rather than 1,200. Um, and we were very open and transparent about why. But then, of course, the way it was reported in the media was a third of data cover you is garbage. It's like, OK. So you know, we're trying to make progress. We're trying to be transparent and all the rest of it. But, but generally speaking, it's, it's been really useful because we've got good technical feedback on an ongoing basis. We're also, um, anyway, I could talk about that all day. But we should break for afternoon tea. Uh, so if everyone could please join me in thanking our panelists.